in this video, I'm going to be taking you through my personal render settings that I use inside of Unreal Engine 5 for getting high quality cinematic renders out of the engine. I'm going to be sharing with you each setting and why I choose what I choose. And hopefully through that explanation, you can better understand your render settings and how to adjust it to your liking. And finally, at the end of this video, I will show you my personal process for getting the rendered images out of Unreal Engine and combining them into finished video files like MP4s or MOV files. I do want to mention that this video is not going to be about path tracing specifically. That's going to come in a later video. So if you'd like to check out those settings, definitely hit subscribe so you get that video. But this is going to be focused on the standard Unreal Engine render settings. And I want to focus on this because I actually find that I can get pretty high quality results with this type of rendering. And I think this will be the most effective for the most majority of you who don't have very high computer systems. So most of my projects up until this point have been rendered using this method. So I wanted to share those settings with you. Let's get into it. So this is the shot I'm going to be using as an example. You can see it's this kind of slow motion jump shot. I actually built this shot for a recent collaboration with the Sky Glass app, which is a virtual production app. They're not sponsoring this video, but I still think it's a pretty cool app. So you should check out that video. It's on the shorts section of the channel. So when I set up for a render, usually I have to double check that I have a few things. One is I need to make sure that the render queue, which is the higher quality version of rendering that Unreal Engine does, is enabled as a plugin. And so if it's not, what I can come up to the edit dropdown and choose plugins, and I will type in render QUE queue. And here we have movie render queue, just make sure that that is enabled. Once we've done that and we have our sequence, I need to double check that I have a camera to render through because even though you have an environment set up in Unreal Engine, if you don't have a camera, you're not gonna really see the same perspective in your render. It's gonna be some random position. So make sure you have a camera in your sequence and a camera cuts track as well. If you don't know how to add that, just come up here to the camera button and add it to your sequence. So now we're ready to render and I'm gonna show you my render settings. I'll hit this little clapper button here to open the movie render queue connected to this sequence. And if your sequence is not added automatically or you open the render queue from going to window cinematics movie render queue, all you need to do is come to your content browser and drag your sequence in. If you have multiple sequences, for example, you want to render at once. So my render settings are not super complicated, but I'm gonna talk through each of them and why I choose them. And hopefully through that, you can come to a better understanding for yourself when you need to make adjustments to your own render settings, what to do and where to make those adjustments. So I have no settings set up here right now. So I'm gonna come up here to the settings section, click on it. And this is what we get by default. We get some things here on the left side, which are basically modules related to our render settings. So I have my exports module, which is gonna choose what type of export I do, whether it's an image sequence or a video file. I have my rendering settings themselves, and then I have my output settings here. And everything we add through this plus button up here under settings will add to these different sections. And you can make your render settings long and complicated or as simple as you'd like. So I'll show you what I usually do is first I turn off JPEG because I actually want to render in a higher quality image format than JPEG. So I'll come here to the plus button and choose EXR sequence. This is what I usually use when rendering my projects. It's a little bit higher quality image file, less compressed. And that's all I do under the export section. But you can also find WAV file, for example, or PNG sequences as, a, as an option here. So under the render settings here, I need to add the anti-aliasing module. Module. So I'm going to come up here to the plus button and choose anti-aliasing. This is really where we're going to tell Unreal Engine to render at a higher quality and make the adjustments that's going to give us a better looking image than we would see normally in our viewport. So the first thing I will do is check on override anti-aliasing. So I'm overriding the anti-aliasing that Unreal Engine does by default. And now we have spatial and temporal sample counts, which let me tell you has confuzzled me throughout the past two years of using Unreal Engine. So I've gone on my own journey of how to use these effectively under what circumstances. So I'll try to use my own words to describe that to you because I personally find it very confusing. So we have spatial sample count and temporal sample count. Now these are different settings that are related in how they work. Temporal sample count, if you can imagine, is kind of how many times it's going to slice up the image in order to resolve the render, okay? It's not a perfect analogy, but just imagine that it's slicing up the image into little pieces. And this is how many pieces it's going to do that into. So I usually like to start with 16 temporal samples. And usually I like to keep spatial 
spatial sample count at one. And I didn't used to do this, but what I found is that spatial sample count acts as a multiplier for temporal sample count. So if temporal sample count is the amount of times the image is cut up during the rendering process, spatial sample count is how many times that is done. The image is rendered again to combine into a higher quality image. Again, not a perfect analogy, but this is kind of how it makes sense to me to think about. So because of that, more often than not, you will only need to do this once. So you can usually leave this spatial sample count at one. And the only time that you wouldn't really want to do this is if you have an image without a lot of motion blur or motion in it is having a hard time resolving the edges around things look too jagged or it's noisy or something like that. Then you would start to raise the spatial sample count. And I would raise it very slowly because it has a very multiplying effect on your render times. So I would go up to four or maybe if that doesn't look good, I would go up to eight. But most likely I would keep this at one and try to raise the temporal sample count to get the quality that I want first because that's going to result in a much quicker render time for, you know, if you look, compare the images, often they will look almost the same quality. So I would stick with 16 temporal sample count to start. That's what I usually use. And then if I'm really trying to push it, I will up it to 32. That's it. Super simple, but it took a lot of experimentation to kind of arrive at this and comparing different images rendered at different samples. So I would recommend that to start. We'll keep it at 16 for now. Next, I'm going to come to the settings, drop down and choose game overrides. So this is going to just blanket change a bunch of settings that will give you the highest quality result in a bunch of different areas. And I'm going to really roughly just call out a few things because I usually turn this on by default, but every once in a while I have a shot that is too complicated and crashes my computer or is not really able to finish the rendering process because it has a lot of geometry in it, a lot of foliage, whatever the reason. And I will need to come into this game overrides and start modifying it and turning off things and kind of playing with it to get a render that finishes. So by default, the game mode override is just going to make sure if you have any kind of overlays on your like HUD images or, or things that are over top of your screen, it's going to knock those out. If you were using the animate your camera, it's going to make sure there's no uh, user interface that pops up during the render. Cinematic quality settings is, is your engine scalability settings. So under the settings over here on the right side, under engine scalability here, we have different settings that we can play around with for anti-aliasing, for shadows. And so this is going to set it to cinematic by default, which is going to give you the highest quality render. So next we have texture streaming. This is going to make sure that it fully loads all the textures and you don't get any of the problems that sometimes happen when you're streaming textures to be more efficient in terms of runtime. But when rendering, sometimes you'll get some fuzzy looking textures. They don't quite load in correctly. So this will disable texture streaming. Use LOD zero. This is going to knock any actors that you have that are using an LOD system. So levels of detail. There's a simpler version of a tree and a more complicated version of a tree is going to knock it to the most complicated version of the tree by default. So this is when using game assets that are built with LODs similar to HLODs and using high quality shadows is pretty straightforward. Shadow distance scale. This is going to make sure you get higher quality shadows based on the distance of the camera. And this as well has to do with that shadow, shadow radius threshold. Override view distance has to do with the bounds of your scene. View distance scale. This is when you have assets that will pop in and out because of the distance that they are from camera. You can adjust that here. And flush grass streaming and flush streaming managers is just going to make sure that you get all the best data when you're loading things like foliage. So that was a lot, but I hope that by that you can kind of know where to look and adjust if you're having renders that are not going through or not working correctly. You can start coming in and adjusting like turning off the use high quality shadows or disabling LODs and see if your renders actually are able to make it through. Now we come to the output setting. So I usually like to render all my projects at 4K. I find that I get a much higher quality result. Even if I'm going to use the render at 1080p or HD, I still like to render it at 4K and I have a graphics card that can handle it in this case. So I'm able to do that. So by default, it's going to be a 1920 by 1080 image, which is HD. So I will always up it to 3840 by 2160, which is the 4K version of 16 by nine. So what do I mean by that? If you're not familiar, each image will have a aspect ratio. Most likely in cinematic renders, you're gonna be using a 16 by nine ratio, which means that the ratio to the width and height is 16 by nine. And that's gonna to correspond to two pixel values, which in this case are 3840 by 2160. That's a number of pixels going up and going to the side. So that's how big your image is gonna be. So if you're not sure when you're rendering,
wondering what resolution you should be rendering at, I usually go to the Wikipedia page list of common resolutions here. And it's very easy to see that I have my eight full HD section here and going up to 2K here, we got 2560 by 1440. And then following the 16 by nine resolution up here to alter HD 4K, we have 3840 by 2160, which is what I put in here. But it will also include here some other resolutions. So if you want to render 5K ultra wide, you can find the exact corresponding resolution here that you'll need to render. So I'm gonna link this resource below the video, but I find this super helpful just to double check that my resolutions are correct. All you need to do is choose what you want the aspect ratio to be and then find the corresponding resolution along this line for how big it should be. 3840 by 2160 is what I use. And by default, it will be rendering at 24 frames per second, which is pretty standard for film projects. I usually like to make sure I adjust this to 30 frames per second. This is really just a personal preference thing. I like 30 frames per second. You might like 24, it's very filmic, but this is where you would adjust that. I use this. So that's pretty much it for what I do. If you want to adjust where your render is going to end up, what the folder that's gonna end up in, you can always adjust that in the output directory here. However, I will mention that if you are rendering shots with a lot of Niagara simulations or particle effects of some kind, any sort of simulation really, for example, this shot has a bunch of laser fire in it. And I don't necessarily want the shot to start and then the laser fire to appear. I want it to be continuous throughout the shot as I'm rendering from the beginning to the end. And in order to do that, I can add an adjustment to my render settings here, which I usually do. So I come to the anti-aliasing here. I open the advanced tab here and under engine warmup count, I will add, let's say 300 frames here or however much you would like. And this is gonna be basically simulating your physics for 300 frames before you actually start rendering. So in my case, laser fire will have 300 frames to get into the correct position so that when my render starts, they're already in frame. One last note on these render settings, if I'm using multiple shots, in this case, I'm just using one shot. So one position, one camera. If you're using multiple shots, you can actually adjust this file format here to incorporate multiple sequences and render them out as separate renders. I will show you how to do that in the video link in the description, but I show you that process about how to actually combine multiple sequences into one render and render them out as multiple image sequences and then read them separately in your editing software. So this is good for me. I'm going to go ahead and hit accept. And that's all I do. Now, if you are setting up these render settings and you want to reuse them, like you set up all the perfect dialed in everything, set up all the perfect samples that work well for your project, you can save those render settings under the clicking on the settings section again and come up here to unsaved config, click the drop down and hit save as preset it will have you choose a folder to save it into. And I'll call this 4K HQ for high quality settings and hit save. Now, every time you open a new render or new sequence, you want to re-render something, all you have to do is come up to the settings, click the drop down, and choose 4K HQ. And that will adjust all your render settings to be the same as they were when you did the initial setup. That's all the render settings I use. I'm gonna go ahead and hit render on this sequence and see how it looks. Okay, so my render just finished finished and it took me about two or three minutes to render the whole thing. This will really vary drastically depending on what type of machine you have, the RAM you have, the graphics card you have specifically. Don't worry about if your render times are a little different than mine, but you will need to adjust them as I uh, described for your machine and your environment that you're rendering. So next I'm going to take the image sequence that I rendered out because it doesn't render out a video by default. I would love if it did, but unfortunately this is the process that we need to use to to create our final image, we need to bring that rendered image sequence into an editing software in order to combine it into the final video file. Now, I know what you're thinking, which is, oh my gosh, this is needlessly complicated, but let me just pitch to you that this is actually gonna give you a higher quality rendered result. Unreal Engine is very good at rendering the images themselves, but in making the final video file, it's not actually that good. It's not actually that good at combining those images and compressing them into a high quality video 
video file. It's just not built for it. There are editing softwares that are very good at this, very good at making efficient, small, and very high quality video files from renders. So even though this seems like an extra step, I promise you it will give you the highest quality animation at the end of the day, which I think is what we all want. So I am gonna use for this example, Adobe Premiere. If you would like to learn how to do this process in DaVinci Resolve, I have another video on how to do that, which I will link below this one in the description. So come over here to my project directory. I'll double click on the import media to start and I will navigate to my rendered images, which for me is my Unreal Engine project folder, which is called Sky Glass Forge under saved and movie renders. This is where you will find all the images that Unreal Engine rendered out. If you are unsure about this, you can always check the output in the movie render queue to see where those images ended up by default. So I'm going to click on the first image in this whole sequence. And if we have multiple shots, we'll need to do this separately for each shot. So I'll click on that first image in the sequence. That's all I need to do. And then I need to come down here to the image sequence checkbox here and click it on so that it knows, all right, this image is the start of a sequence of images. They're going to create a finished shot. So I'll go ahead and hit open, which my head is blocking. Okay, so now I have this render and if I double click on it, we can see our finished render. It turned out great. And I will drag this into my timeline or right click on it and create new sequence from clip. Now, if you're familiar with the editing process, you can now add multiple clips to this to make a finished video. I talk about that, how to do that in my course. But for us, we're really just gonna render this into a finished video file. So we can see that all our image sequences are playing through and it's this beautiful finished image. And so I'm gonna come here to file and export media, or you can press control M. And it's very important in particularly Adobe Premiere that you have the sequence that you want to export highlighted with this blue box, which you can click in it to make sure it's highlighted, it has messed me up multiple times. So come to file, export and media. This will open the export dialog for Adobe Premiere. I'm going to leave these settings as is. And under the preset here, all we need to do here is just double check that these settings are matching the settings that we rendered out of Unreal Engine. And it's not downscale or reducing the quality. So under the preset, what I usually choose is match source adaptive high bitrate. This is going to match the source in terms of resolution and frame rate and adaptive bitrate is going to compress the image in an intelligent way to give me the smallest file possible with the highest quality. So if I can expand my video here and hit the more button, I can double check the target bitrate here. And for me, this might be a little high. I might lower this to something like 48. This is really the setting that's going to adjust how big your video file is and how much quality you're going to get out of the mp4. So for me, I'm going to keep it at 48 for a 4k video file and for a 1080p or an HD video file, you probably can lower it even more, but this is fine for me in terms of quality. So I'm going to go ahead and hit export and I can come here to my exported mp4 file and open it and it looks great. So I hope you found this video helpful. These are the settings that I use on almost every single project. If you have questions about some of these settings or how to apply it to your particular project, or workflow, definitely drop those questions in the comments below this video and I'll do my best to answer them and help you out. You can see that the actual settings inside of Unreal Engine and the process is not complicated. It's really about fine tuning each little part to give you the result that you want. So if you found this helpful in some way, definitely hit that thumbs up button so I know to make more videos like this. And if you'd like a full curriculum by me about this full process of making animation and films with Unreal Engine, I have a series of online courses as well as a free training which I will link below this video and I will see you in the next one.